Hmm. Well, I think we can probably go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everybody to Fort Stevens State Park. Uh, my name is Dane Osis. Uh, I'm a park ranger out here. Uh, this is David. Uh, we'll be you guys' uh, mushroom tour guides, I guess, today. So the plan for the day, um, we're going to be doing uh, a mushroom hike. So we're going to first start off by talking about uh, kind of kind of mushrooms in general, kind of what the role in the forest, kind of what we're, uh, we're looking at. Uh, well, I've got a few samples here. We'll talk about some of the different types that are out there. Uh, the talk should be about um, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so, depending on questions. Uh, after the talk, we can uh, take a walk out into the forest. Uh, there's a lot of stuff popping out right now. It's, you know, October's kind of the best month on the coast for finding mushrooms. Um, so we're looking at probably hour and a half or so. Um, feel free to come and go if you guys need to take off. No worries, that's fine. Um, if you guys have any questions throughout the program, by all means, ask, raise your hand, ask away. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, Battery Russell, you do not need a day use pass here. If you go to the lake or the historic area, we do charge a day use fee there. So make sure you have a pass here at Battery Russell. You don't need one. Um, and again, the restroom is located just off to my left over there. Um, but here in the Northwest, we've got a pretty rich habitat for a lot of mushrooms. Uh, so just curious, how many people here uh, have picked and eaten wild mushrooms before? So quite a few of you guys. So what types of mushrooms do you guys collect? Okay, chanterelles, lobster, lobster mushrooms, Morel. king beliefs, morels. So yeah, so we've 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 got quite a few variety of uh, really good edible mushrooms that you guys can find in our forest. Uh, so mushroom hunting can be a really fun activity for the whole family. Uh, if you know what you're doing, you can find some really good ones. Uh, but I want to preface this by saying, you you really need to do your homework though, because there's obviously mushrooms out there. Uh, that you don't want to eat, that will make you sick, that could potentially kill you. So uh, again, mushroom hunting can be a great activity, but if you do plan on eating them, do your homework. Make sure you know what you're doing, and it's kind of number one rule in mushroom hunting is if, if there's any doubt, if you're not 100% confident of the type of mushroom it, it is, don't eat it, right? It's not worth risking uh, your health over. Um, but mushrooms are kind of mysterious, you know, they kind of they kind of spring up out of in our yards and our forests, you know, after we get some rainfall almost overnight, seems like. Um, so, and, and, you know, there's a lot of, you know, reading the newspaper about people that eat a mushroom and then need a liver transplant. So there's a lot of fear and a lot of kind of, uh, you know, apprehension about mushrooms, I guess. But basically what you're seeing when you're seeing a mushroom like this, you're seeing uh, only part of the fungus. You're seeing the fruiting body of the, of the organism. So uh, underground, uh, or you know, in a, in a log or whatever, you have what's called mycelium. So mycelium is, uh, you may have seen it before, it's a white, thready substance, kind of mm -hmm. cottony looking, that's, uh, that you may be in your garden or in an old log pile perhaps. Uh, so that's there all the time. Uh, when the conditions are favorable, usually when we get some rainfall in, the, in, in autumn, uh, they'll produce mushrooms. And the mushroom, again, it's the fruiting body, it's producing spores. So uh, I use the analogy of apples on a tree. So your tree, your apple tree would be the mycelium. Your apples would be the mushroom itself. And so this is a great big king bowl eat here. Uh, it's kind of umbrella shaped because it's protecting the, uh, the spore body that's, that's underneath here. So it's actually releasing spores out into the air only, even though we can't see it. Uh, other ones are a little bit more, um, a little more obvious. So these are puff balls. And so if you guys have ever seen a puff ball, you know, if you, if you disturb it, it'll smoke. And those are basically uh, spores that are being dispersed. So I apologize to the people in front there. You guys are the um, but again, that's, that's kind of what mushrooms are here for. They're, they're simply out there to get uh, spores out into the environment. Um, understanding what type of uh, mushroom, um, kind of what its habits are, what's role in the forest is, will help you actually pinpoint certain areas to look. So when I go out mushroom hunting, I'll look for boletes or chanterelles or oyster mushrooms, and I'll actually look for that particular type in a certain type of habitat. So again, understanding more about uh, what kind of environment your mushroom grows in will help you better locate areas to look, right? So the first type of mushrooms, uh, again, mushrooms, fungi, they're not, they're not a plant, they're an animal. They rely on an organism to get their food. So they're kind of in between. Um, the first type are what we call saprophytic fungi. So saprophytic fungi are the, uh, well, most people think of when they think of mushrooms. They're the decomposers. And, um, you know, most of your mushrooms that you find in your grocery store uh, are, are saprophytic fungi. They can be easily cultivated. You know, your, your portobello cremini mushroom, that's grown on, you know, compost on a mushroom farm on a large scale. 
Uh, you can find uh, even some of your wild mushrooms that you find in the grocery store, shiitake, uh, oyster mushrooms. Those are most likely grown on a, on a commercial scale. You can find uh, wild oyster mushrooms. So there's a lot of mushrooms that are growing out in the forest on dead logs and dead trees. Again, they're breaking down that woody material back into the soil. So these are, uh, these are wild oyster mushrooms. They're growing on usually dead, dead alder wood, dead hardwoods. Um, and again, their kind of role in the forest is they, you know, if without saprophytic fungi, you really wouldn't be able to go through the forest. You know, there'd be so much debris that's, that's down and around that you wouldn't be able to get, get around. So they take that organic woody material and, and break it back into the soil. So they play a pretty important role in the, uh, the forest there. Um, another type are uh, what we call mycorrhizal fungi. So mycorrhizal fungi are the uh, fungi that have a relationship with plants. So you have to have the plant in order to have the mushroom and sometimes vice versa. Often those plants are trees. So uh, being able to identify uh, what species of tree will help you figure out what type of mushrooms. So some of you guys mentioned you guys like to pick uh, chanterelles, right? Uh, do you guys find chanterelles in a forest or a field? Forest. In a forest, right? So they're mycorrhizal with conifer trees usually, Douglas fir, western hemlock, uh, sometimes spruce. Um, so it's one of the reasons why the mycorrhizal fungi that are edible are really expensive. So I've seen chanterelles for sale in, in Fred Meyers of all places in season sometimes. They're pretty sad looking chanterelles, you know, they're pretty old and they were charging like 15 or $20 a pound for them. Right next door to them you had your cremini which were like $3 a pound. And again, the price difference is your, your cremini are mass produced on a large scale 12 months out of the year. Your chanterelles can only be hand picked in the forest a few months out of the year. Um, the last type are parasitic fungi. Uh, parasitic fungi can be parasitic on a whole range of hosts. Uh, often trees are the victims of parasitic fungi. Um, if you guys see those woody conchs growing on the side of a tree, again, that's a sign there's some decay going on. Um, this is a, uh, uh, what's commonly called the dyer's polypore. It's actually growing on a stick here, but that's a very common uh, uh, mushroom that we look for when we do our hazard tree inspections. Um, and they, especially the big Sitka spruces, they really cause some of that heart rot and cause some problems. And uh, you, you guys may be familiar with Oswald West State Park. Uh, it's about 40 miles south of here. It's right on the edge of the ocean. We've got big old growth Sitka spruce trees. Uh, we used to have a campground there. Um, it was one summer we had about an eight foot diameter spruce tree fall down and hit, miss a guy's tent by about that much. It was amazing, no one got hurt. But they did a, a hazard tree analysis and they dis determined that, that this particular fungus, the, uh, the <coughs> Dyer's polypore, the Phalaeus schwannitzii, is, is very prevalent in a lot of these older Sitka spruce trees. And so we decided it's probably not the best idea to have a campground right underneath it, so now it's a day use area only. Um, but again, it's, so it's bad for the individual tree, right? But for the overall health of a forest, it's good to have snags and openings in the forest and whatnot. So they definitely play a vital role. Um, probably the most well-known uh, parasitic fungi uh, for a mushroom hunter standpoint is the lobster mushroom. So lobster mushrooms are parasitic on other mushrooms. So the, uh, the host mushroom for the lobster mushroom is uh, generally this guy. It's, it's a rusula, short stemmed rusula. It's a white gilled mushroom uh, that's edible but generally it's not eaten because it doesn't taste very good. Yeah. But what happens is you have the, the hypomyces fungus, the, the lobster fungus, which is basically this orange crust, parasitizes the, the, uh, the short stem rusula. So this mushroom is, is the same as this one, but with that uh, lobster mushroom attacking a parasite on it. So not only does it change the appearance from a white mushroom to an orange mushroom, but it also changes the taste. A lot of people like to eat lobster mushrooms where virtually no one eats the host mushroom. Um, so before you go out, you just need a few basic uh, tools. Uh, you need some sort of uh, a knife. Uh, a lot, you can get special mushroom knives like the one I have here. They've got a blade on one end, a brush on the other. Um, if you're trying to identify a mushroom, you wanna get as much of the mushroom out as possible because uh, you really wanna look at all the characteristics of it. Uh, if you're eating a mushroom uh, for the table, right? You want to take good care of it, clean it off with your brush, uh, and make sure you're only picking young mushrooms that are in good condition. Uh, mushrooms have a tendency to get wormy and buggy, so make sure you check your mushrooms, right? Uh, you want a good uh, container for them. Uh, baskets are a popular uh, uh, thing to put your mushrooms in. Buckets work. What you want to avoid is like Ziploc bags. Mushrooms have a tendency to want to breathe. If you put your mushroom in a Ziploc bag, it's going to really deteriorate on you pretty quickly. 
Um, and then you need a good field guide. And there's all sorts of books on mushrooms out there. Uh, the field guide that I recommend the most um, is this one right here. It's called All That the Rain Promises and More by David Aurora. Uh, it's got really good uh, information in it. It's got really good color photographs, uh, common name, scientific name. And what I really like about this book is when you're trying to identify a mushroom, it's not good enough to just look at the picture and say, well, it kind of looks like what I'm looking at, it must be what it is. You really want to look at all of its characteristics and make very sure that you're, you're confident you know what it is. And this book has a list of uh, key features that you want to look at, you know, six or eight features that you can match your mushroom up to and uh, see if it matches up or not. Um, he also wrote Mushrooms Demystified, which has about 2,000 species, you know, kind of like the Mushroom Bible. Uh, but definitely invest in this book if you're interested in mushroom picking. Uh, we do sell this at our uh, gift shop in our museum over in the historic area if you're looking for a copy of it. Um, so the rules and the regulations. Uh, so just like in mushroom hunting, there's no shortcut about rules and regs. Different agencies, different land managers have different regulations. Here at Fort Stevens, we do allow personal use picking. So you can't sell your mushrooms, but you can pick small quantities, you know, a basket full uh, to take home to eat. Uh, we just simply ask that you only pick in the day use areas, not in the campground. Uh, and then just make sure that you park in designated parking lots. Make sure you have a pass if it's required. Um, other than that, you're, you're more than welcome to come out and hunt. We've got about 4,000 acres at Fort Stevens. Um, so there's a lot of really good areas. So you might be wondering, what can I find out there, right? So probably the number one mushroom at Fort Stevens and probably the world. This is probably the most popular mushroom out there. This is the, uh, the King Bow Wheat. It's got about as many common names as there are languages in the world, which means usually it's a really, really good one or a really, really bad one. These are really good. Um, so the, uh, the Italian name for it is Porcini, and that's how you would refer to it in a restaurant most likely. Um, it's, instead of having like a gill mushroom like that you would be familiar with, it's got a, a sponge layer. So basically underneath the cap, you've got uh, a whole bunch of, of tubes there. Um, Do and you eat the whole thing? So you can eat the whole thing. Uh, I would recommend, unless the tubes are pure white, you'd want to cut them out, just simply because they have a very slimy texture and uh, it wouldn't be as appetizing. So this is the same mushroom, but a younger version of it. Um, and you really want to get them when they're nice and young and firm. This one's actually fairly young. They actually can still, uh, you know, the, the pores will mature out to be eventually a brown color. And so uh, you want to make sure that you get the ones that are nice and uh, solid white in the middle. Um, sometimes they have a tendency to get uh, worms and bugs, but if you cut it open and see how nice and pure white and, and clean that is, um, you know, that's an excellent mushroom for, for the table. Um, the, the Russians and Ukrainians call Belgrave, which means white mushroom, and you can see why they call it that. Um, so these are mycorrhizal, so they grow uh, in association with trees, typically spruce and pine. And if you guys look around here, if you guys know what type of trees these are, we've got uh, shore pine and Sitka spruce as our primary trees at Fort Stevens. <laughs> um, other ones, uh, you guys mentioned you like to pick chanterelles. So chanterelles, we do have some chanterelles at Fort Stevens, although uh, it's definitely not the most common mushroom. Um, they're an orange mushroom. They've got very kind of primitive gills that run down the, uh, the stem, kind of more like ridges. Uh, one of the characters I look for in a chanterelle is if you cut it open, it's got solid white flesh that's similar to string cheese, right? Um, there's a lot of orange mushrooms out there, but just because it's orange and funnel shaped doesn't make it a chanterelle, right? There's a lot of fall chanterelles, a lot of lookalikes. So, you know, you wouldn't go into a grocery store and confuse a head of lettuce with a head of uh, cabbage because they're both round and green, right? So why would you confuse a mushroom which could potentially poison you, right? So make sure you do your homework, look at all the mushroom, look at all the characteristics, and do proper identification before you plan on eating it. Um, so the bow leets are usually, unfortunately, only around for a few weeks or a couple months in the fall. Chanterelles, uh, I can usually start finding them around the 4th of July, uh, right along the coastline, and you can find them all the way up in the hills until around Christmas time. But September, October, uh, or November are usually the best three months to find these guys. Um, further inland, uh, on the east slope of the Cascades, or the coast and Cascade Range, you can find white chanterelles. So this is a white chanterelle. It basically looks identical to a regular chanterelle, but it's white in color. Um, they're excellent, and sometimes you can find them in abundance. Uh, I was out picking a couple weeks ago and, and on some private land, and we found about 47 pounds 
of white and golden chanterelles in an area no bigger than what we're standing. And we didn't even really, you know, we picked maybe a quarter of what was out there. So they can sometimes be in abundance. Uh, this year we've had some really good rainfall, some, some mild temperatures. Uh, it's been a tremendous mushroom year for a lot of species, especially the chanterelles. Um, so there's no uh, mushroom that's like foolproof, right? You know, you really want to make sure you do your identification. But there are mushrooms that are easy to identify, easier to identify than other ones. So the hedgehog mushroom. So this one kind of at first glance looks like a chanterelle. You know, it's kind of got that pinkish orange look to it. But if you flip it over, if you guys look really, really closely, uh, it actually has tiny little spines. So little teeth. So if you're finding an orange mushroom with spines underneath it. There's no real look-alikes for that. That's a, they call them hedgehogs, right? Uh, some people prefer hedgehogs to actually to chanterelles, and you can find them in uh, numerous quantities if you find the right right yeah. patch, perhaps. It's the tree also. Uh, so yeah, so they're mycorrhizal, uh, Douglas fir, uh, spruce, basically a lot of the conifer trees. The similar area. Yeah. So there, uh, there's a lot of mushrooms that you could eat, um, but you probably don't want to. And if you do find uh, that you like some of these mushrooms, you're in luck because you don't have a lot of competition, whereas the bull eats, uh, you do. Uh, so a lot of the, uh, the lactarius or uh, milky caps, these are called uh, delicious milky caps. Uh, they are edible. I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily call them delicious. Uh, they're, they're not bad. They have kind of a grainy texture, so they're not commonly eaten. But uh, I know people that do like these and they're just not in starting to fruit by in really big numbers and they're usually associated with pine and, and spruce so another good area to find is the delicious milky cap uh, they call them milky caps because um, they're brittle they snap like chalk and then once the uh, the gills are cut they actually will exude out a um, a juice like a milky like juice sometimes it's white sometimes it's uh, kind of like a clearish this one is actually kind of an orange kind of looks like carrot juice or something um, you know, uh, the russula, again, russula is a big common uh, mushroom. It's a big family of mushrooms. Again, they've got uh, <laughs> spherical cells, so they break cleanly like chalk, so you can take the stem and it snaps audibly. If it does that, it's either russula or milky cap. Um, and if it doesn't bleed out any juice, it's a russula. Um, again, there's hundreds and hundreds of species of russula. Most of them aren't very good. You know, there is a shrimp russula that's quite good, but most of them, you know, sometimes 60 or 70% of the mushrooms you find are in the russula family. Um, so there's a lot of mushrooms that you're gonna encounter that's probably like, well, you could take it home and eat it, but you probably don't want to, right? And then there's some mushrooms that you don't want to eat for sure, right? There's mushrooms that can make you sick, that could potentially uh, put you in the hospital. So the number one, uh, poisoner of um, people in the world, you know, more mushroom deaths are caused by one family of mushrooms than any other. That's the Amanita family. So Amanitas are a big family of mushrooms. They're home to deadly poisonous ones. They're home to edible ones and someone's in between. Uh, they're very, uh, sometimes can be quite colorful. So this is a type of Amanita called the, uh, the fly Amanita, the Amanita muscaria. Um, they are very numerous, uh, usually in the fall. Uh, they're unmistakable. I mean, it's the, the red one with the white spots. You've probably seen these before, or at least seen them in like fairy tales or, you know, Super Mario or something, right? Um, so these ones um, aren't necessarily deadly poisonous. Uh, they are toxic, they are hallucinogenic. They are found throughout the, the Northern Hemisphere. And the effects on, of if it's toxic or hallucinogenic vary from mushroom to mushroom, and they vary from region to region. So people have utilized this mushroom for, uh, for a lot of different uses for, for thousands of years in Siberia. The, the tribes up there, the shaman would use them for religious ceremonies. Um, if you guys have ever read the book Alice in Wonderland, supposedly mm -hmm. Lewis Carroll <laughs> ate this mushroom and you know what happens in Alice in Wonderland, it's a lot of unusual things going on, right? <laughs> um, the ones in the Northwest are typically more toxic. Uh, so people that do eat this one usually have a pretty bad time. Um, the toxins are actually water soluble. So there, I've seen people out here picking this one for the table for food. Uh, so if you, if you chop it up, you boil it in a big pot of water and you change the water two or three times, right? At some point the toxins are dissipated and it becomes edible. So my recommendation would be to stick the chanterelles or beliefs, right? And try to, try to boil the toxins out of it. Uh, but these are, uh, they're a beautiful mushroom, you know, they're unmistakable. And they're also an indicator species. So they grow in the same habitat at the same time of year. 
as your uh, Boeats or Portinis, right? Oh. So they, I've seen actually uh, a big, big fairy ring of Amanitas before with a nice Boeat right in the middle. Um, and again, there are Amanitas that are deadly poisonous. Uh, death caps, they're actually uh, native to Europe. They were actually brought over here accidentally and the roots of the mycelium was in the roots of other trees. And uh, they're usually associated with oak, which we don't have really oak too much in, in Clatsop County here. Um, so like Northern California, Southern British Columbia, you hear about people that eat death caps and mistake it and, and get, you know, really bad symptoms and sometimes die. Um, but what they're saying is they're actually finding that these death caps are starting to convert mycological partners, so, uh, or mycorrhizal partners. So instead of just oaks anymore, they're starting to be associated with like spruce and fir and whatnot. So it's probably just a matter of time before they start showing up in our areas. And unfortunately, everywhere they show up, at some point someone makes the mistake and eats the wrong one. So again, be 100% sure of your identification uh, before you eat it. I mean, just last week we were doing a mushroom hike and we had a woman had picked some nice king bolites, and I was looking in her basket. Also in her basket was a uh, very young amanita. So I took it out of her basket and told her you need to do more due diligence because you don't want to be eating this mushroom. There, it's got a brown cap. Um, this is basically this is covered. This is a young amanita that's still covered in the universal veil, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that. Uh, that veil basically breaks out later on to be scabs and then um, or warts on the cap here. And so me, to me, I don't know, I've seen a million Amanitas, so I know right off the bat. But I guess until to an untrained eye, she was just looking at the shape, I guess, and didn't see the, uh, the, the, the differences. So again, if you do plan on eating your mushrooms, you should be very, very familiar with the mushroom. You know, you should be, it should be like walking to Fred Meyer and picking up produce in your grocery aisle, right? Uh, if you're not to that state, make sure that you identify each mushroom, go through the code, you know, go get in your book and make sure it matches up exactly with every, uh, every one. Because again, all it takes is one mushroom to make a mistake and you definitely don't want to get, get the wrong one, right? So that's a real quick, brief introduction to just a few of the mushrooms that we have out in our forest. You know, there are really thousands and thousands of species out there. Um, and as we go through the fall, different mushrooms start coming out as that you didn't have before. So just like vegetables have seasons, mushrooms also have seasons. Are there morels here? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have very many morels. The uh, morels come out in the springtime and they're usually further inland, like in the Cascade Mountains, Eastern Oregon. Eagle. On the coast, it's Eagle very seldom. Forest. Yeah, forest fires is usually areas they've, they've been found in That's after a burn. Uh, is there any questions we can answer here before we go out on our hike today? Can I ask? What, how do you clean and or wash the mushrooms? What's the best Prepare. technology? So uh, how do you clean and wash mushrooms? So basically it kind of depends on the mushroom, but generally you don't want to use uh, any water at all uh, if, if possible. My recommendation is to kind of clean them up in the forest, you know, to kind of cut the dirt away, brush them off. Um, uh, when you when you get them home, you can kind of chop them up and, and kind of saute them. A lot of mushrooms have a really high water content, so when you cook them, you're going to get a lot of water in there, and that will clean them up a little bit. But again, don't be throwing old, nasty mushrooms in with your good ones. Don't be throwing dirty ones in with your pristine, clean ones. Uh, there are certain ones, like the, uh, uh, the cauliflower mushroom. It looks kind of like a bouquet of egg noodles, basically. That one, you could actually will parboil it before I cook it to, to tenderize it. You can take a garden hose and wash that one down. But generally, just try to brush them off as best you can and, and get them clean. So, question. This one looks like it was pulled out. Can you demonstrate like how you would cut that? Or okay, so the uh, there's this big debate about do I cut the mushroom off? Do I pull it out? Uh, they've, been, they've done studies on chanterelles uh, up on the Bull Run watershed, and basically. They pulled them out, they cut them, they picked one, they picked them all, and they basically determined it didn't matter how or how, you, how many you picked. You know, basically, just by act of picking a mushroom, like, basically I use the analogy of apples on a tree, right? So the, the tree would be the mycelium, your apples would be the mushroom. So just by harvesting your, your, your apples on your tree, you're not doing any damage to the tree, it comes back and, so the same concept applies. So, uh, chanterelles often will have a big root that goes down into the dirt, so you can ply them up and then cut them off, or you can cut them off at the ground, doesn't really matter. Uh, a lot of these bow eats, um, you're only gonna see part of the cap. Like when I saw this one, I could just barely see part of the cap coming up. So if you were to cut that off, you're leaving the majority of the mushroom underground. 
what I would do is I would take my knife and kind of pop it up out of the ground, kind of clean it off, kind of cover the hole up. Um, so yeah, so just by picking or cutting your mushrooms, uh, you're not really doing any harm to the mycelium. So. All right, any other questions? Yeah. You said that you can find, I guess I'm going to learn the, the names, but the white ones next to the red ones, does it affect the poison that you find them next to each other? No. It doesn't? No, yeah, they're not going to cross-pollinate or cross-contaminate or anything like that. <laughs> what is this? So this is a, uh, this is a scaly chanterelle. So you can see the, the, this is the young one, the top's all kind of worded up. As they get big, they have a really very uh, fluted like base tunnel look to them. Uh, these are not recommended. They're, uh, many people are made ill by these ones. And the main, and they do have very similar look to a chanterelle under the gills. But once you uh, look at the cap, the cap, the, sh the true chanterelle is not gonna have a big base that goes down and not a hole in the middle and not gonna have flakes on the top here. So even though they look similar, they're, you know, I guess somewhat closely related. I guess they were. They are. There are some major differences that you're gonna you're gonna see. So again, I, I want to stress this today. Is like when you're identifying them, look at all the characteristics in the book and not just relying on one or two. Because a lot of mushrooms have similarities, but they're always gonna have something different that you should be able to pick up on and, and figure out. So. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we've got quite a crowd today. Uh, well, we're gonna do a hike. Um, so we've got a couple options for you guys. Um, so I'm gonna kind of take the, the bike trail that kind of takes over to Crossover Road to get in some big spruce trees. Hopefully we'll find uh, a few things out there. You're more than welcome to come along with me and join me. Um, if, you, if you guys don't wanna have a walk with a big giant crowd, you're more than welcome to kind of venture off on your own and try to uh, find some things. Um, we can meet back up here in say uh, an hour. So it's uh, 1.30 right now. Uh, if you do go off on your own, meet back around 2.30 here, and then we can uh, we can go through some identification and see what you guys are finding. Sound good? Sounds great. Thank you. Okay. Oh, what is this? Okay. 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 So the, if you use water, you're not going to be water log, soggy, and serious. Yeah. Like, we don't share. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's our best friend. <laughs> Joanne. Joanne, are you going to come? So yeah, we'll kind of uh, we'll kind of make our way on this bike trail. Uh, we'll kind of make. We'll kind of go pretty quick until we start getting into a little bit better habitat. Keep your eye on the, the bike trail for anything you guys might see. If you guys do something, we'll, we'll stop and try to identify it. Uh, right now, we're kind of, again, you want to pay attention to what kind of trees are around you. Again, these are the, uh, the shore pine primarily. We'll be going through kind of a swampy area through some alder. Usually, you don't find much in the swampy area except for on a dead alder, maybe some oysters. And then we'll get into a big, more mature uh, spruce forest with a nice uh, green carpety moss area. That's kind of the preferred area we're going to be looking today. But again, keep your eyes peeled and see if you guys can find anything. You see something right here? Yeah, Well, we'll still look at it. He's the one that knows. I'm here just helping him out. So yeah, so she found a uh, small uh, kind of reddish mushroom here. Oh, yes. um, it's in the, uh, the Russula family. So we know that because we can take the stem and we can break it and it snaps cleanly like chalk. We know if it does that, it's either russula or lactarius, like a milky cap. And again, the milky caps, if we were to cut the uh, the gills and we would wait and look, you would get a, a, a juice exuding out of the gills. And these are dry. So the, the russula are a, a type of russula, basically. And uh, the whole chapter of russula in uh, Aurora's book, he says better picked than kicked, you know, better, or kicked than picked, better hunted than hunted, you know, a whole series. So they're, they're very numerous, common uh, mushroom, but generally, you know, you don't leave them in the forest, right? <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.
Oh, little brown one. There's no one there. If you guys want to pick that one up. I found oh. these a little ways back. I mean, so yeah. So these are uh, these are called earth balls. So they grow underground, and they're kind of tuber shaped. A lot of people, yeah. There's another one. A lot of people see these and they think that uh, they're familiar with truffles, right? Truffles grow underground. Um, they're round like this. They think, oh, I must have found a truffle. Well, there's other mushrooms that grow similarly to a truffle, and these are not edible. These will make you sick. Um, and again, there's a couple of different types. You know, these are pure white inside. You have another one that I think that's also white inside or grayish. There's ones that are pure black that are, just have a kind of a foul smell to them. We've got this other one. Someone else, found, yeah, found another one there. So uh, we can do the ID on this one real quick. I mean, I know what it is already, but we'll, uh, we'll pretend we don't. So I'm on page 32 in Aurora's book. So. Uh, the first thing we want to look at here is the cap, yellow brown to ochre, tan or straw colored. So it's kind of a brownish, light brown. Uh, the edge of cap with furrowed bumps, bumpy furrows. So if you look really close there, it's got kind of like a, a little ridges, I guess. That's what it's referring to. Uh, the gills are white to yellowish, but often spotted uh, with brown. If you guys look there, they're kind of a, a whitish color to it. Uh, the odor is strongly fragrant, like maraschino cherries or almond extract, sometimes with an unpleasant component also. So it does have a, uh, it does have quite an odor to it. It's kind of like a Swedish, it is kind of like a maraschino cherry, I would say. Um, the entire mush mushroom is brittle. The snap, uh, the stalk snapping openly like chalk. So again, Rusula, which it does. Want to smell it? <laughs> uh, veil ring and vulva absence. So there's no ring on it, no bulbous stem. Um, it's found alone or in groups in the woods and their edges widespread and common. Uh, edibility, poisonous. So this is the fragrant Rusula. And so they're, they're a quite common one they have in the forest. Uh, they have an interesting smell, but it's one that we want to kind of leave out here. It's not a, not a good one to eat. So I get all those characteristics <laughs> combined. <laughs> it's it's to, but is it <laughs> so yeah, so if, if you know, I'm, I'm doing shortcuts today, but you would first go to see does the mushroom have gills? Okay, so there's And then you would look at the characteristics of what the gills would be like to get you to its right chapter. Okay. And then on the back, it would be... <laughs> so just like that, uh, the mushroom we had on the table that I puffed and it smoked, that was a very mature puffball. So this is a, uh, a, a much younger one, so we can cut it open and you can see it's, uh, it's white on the inside. So uh, these are edible when they're pure white inside. If they're yellow or anything besides white, don't eat them, they can make you sick. Um, puffballs on the coast here usually only get about this big. But there are oh, puffballs that grow up in the mountains and in the Midwest and stuff to get like basketball size. Wow. Yeah. So sometimes people eat those ones because they're a lot bigger. Um, you would want to make sure that you're not getting so uh, some of the amanitas when they're very young resemble a puffball. You know, they call them amanita eggs. And sometimes if you cut them open, you actually can see the outline of kind of like the gills and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So if you do eat puffballs, just make sure that it's pure white inside and there's no like amanita shape in there. Yeah. So. There's a little white mushroom. That's probably uh, could be agaricus, could be uh, lapiota. Um, so a lot of the gilled mushrooms are uh, quite hard to identify. Um, you know, it's, it's not a russula, it's not a lactarius. Uh, some of the uh, 
some of the agarica species are, uh, they look, they're in the same family as your uh, Carmini portobello. So the problem is people, they see uh, agaricus and it looks familiar to them, right? It looks like they're mushrooms they know from the grocery store. Well, the problem is there's some really, really good tasting agaricus, like the prince, but there's some agaricus that will make you pretty sick. It won't kill you, but it'll make you quite ill. And again, they're not a very good, easy beginner mushroom because they look relatively the same. You kind of have to go through some characteristics for them. Um, so again, not a big, you know, Agaricus, Lepiota, some of them kind of you want to be careful with and, and wait till you get more advanced before you eat them. So we got some bikers coming through here, so. <laughs> Um, a few of them. They're, they're certainly not uh, not very common, but you do see them occasionally. So yeah, we've got a uh, several of the mushrooms here. Mm -hmm. Here's one right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've got one here. Mm -hmm. One here. Mm -hmm. Slugs have been kind of gnawing them up. So these are a type of russula. Um, you can see they break like chalk. There's one right there. So this one, it, it could be a, a shrimp russula potentially. We'll, uh, we'll go through it. They seem to be too small to me, but I don't know. So yeah, we'll hold it up. A one. Okay, yeah, we'll hold that there. So the shrimp russula, um, the cap is red to purple or purple brown, sometimes partly or entirely green or brown. So these are kind of a dark purple color, I would guess. Is that what you say what it would be? Uh, the surface of stock is slimy, sticky or slimy when moist, usually adhering debris when dry. So yours has got some, uh, some pine needles and stuff on it. Um, and obviously they're very dry, we haven't much rain lately. Uh, the gills are whitish to yellowish or brownish stains. So yeah, this is whitish. What is, the gills are kind of destroyed on that one. So that's not a real good sample. Uh, the stalk with at least a blush of rose, sometimes entirely rosy, staining yellow when bruised or handled, then brown. So some of these, that one has a stain of a blue, of a, of a rose. This one doesn't really. But again, it was growing right next to each other. So we're assuming it's the same mushroom, but again, yes. unless it matches up exactly, don't eat it, right? And is it staining, uh, is it staining yellow on your guys' mushrooms at all? It's starting to stain a little bit here as I handle it. <laughs> Uh, the entire mushroom is brittle, snapping like chalk, so it does that. Uh, the taste is not peppery. Chew on a small piece of the cap. <laughs> does anyone want to chew on a piece? I'll chew on a piece. I'm not scared. So the russula is, they're not going to, I mean, basically one of the characteristics of the russula is, is pepperiness. So chew on a small piece, wait a bit, and then spit it out. No you can see what... Not <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty mild. Sometimes it's a delayed reaction, so you kind of want to wait. So it does, it's not peppery. The odor is fishy or shrimpy when old. So you got the oldest one there. What's it smell like? Ooh, yeah, that's very fishy. Very fishy, right? Uh, the veil, ring, and vulva absent, which it is. Uh, the spores are yellowish. Uh, on the ground or under conifers, often partially hidden by duffer needles, why it's part in common. Edibility, delicious. The young young caps can be sauteed, toasted, or stuffed and broiled. All the ones develop a strong trippy odor when cooked, but are still tasty. So this is the shrimp russula. Um, it's one of the, it's the best russula out there. Um, and again, that odor on an old one is very, very noticeable. And what I noticed was when you cook, especially younger ones, you really get that. It smells like a, a cross between crab and shrimp. And then the, the flavor is very reminiscent of seafood, like a shellfish mushroom taste to it. So. Yeah. 
it probably is. I mean, what I would want to do is I would want to go through that all those characteristics on every mushroom I pick, especially the the shrimp russula can be very. There's a lot of lookalikes and there's a lot of discrepancies between the mushrooms. So. That's an amanita, or a, no, that's a tricholoma there, and that one can. There's some tricholoma they'll put you in the hospital. So again, it's <laughs> it's it's one of those things that you want to you know. The, the shrimp russula, it's I don't rec- recommend it for beginner mushroom pickers because it's it's yeah. not the easiest one to identify, right? Oh, a nice. Uh, oh. You know what that one is? Yeah, yeah nice baby uh, king bowlet here. Nice find. There's a more russula there. So. Yeah, that's another type of russula. And then again, russula are very very common, and a lot of them are going to have. So when we shoot on it, you know, we're looking for a mild flavor. There's russula that are like very, very peppery, everything from radish all the way up to like battery acid almost, you know, I mean, it'll blister your tongue and pass Dane, yes. yeah. yeah, they eat lots of mushrooms. This is, this is a type of russula. Um, it's probably not in this book. You'd have to get the bigger one. Um, and again, it's not probably not going to be something you really want to eat. So. Which one would you eat? Which one wouldn't you eat? <laughs> so this is this is a baby king bully that's very very young and it's you know hasn't really developed yet. This is an amanita egg. So that's a very small amanita that's still very young. So don't eat these ones. And eat it. so again, they can look similar and you can see why people might get confused sometimes. But um, but again, yeah, you wanna make sure, and, and these really small boletes, like they're not the easiest to identify. Like I know what it is, but like, versus like this great big one that's matured out, that's much more easy to identify. But yeah, that's that's a king bully. These are amanitas. I'll use them for samples if you don't want them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 or not. <laughs> 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 the kind of the brown cat. The, the, the edges are ribbed. Kind of like that one. So they're the same. They're just older. One's a mature. And one smells like, yeah. it smells like uh, maraschino cherries. Mm-hmm. Kind of like a sickeningly like, sweet. Oh, yeah. yeah, the young one you really smell, the old one you don't really smell too much, but that's not a shrimp one, no, but it's a russula. Good job. One that's edible. Would you call that a coppery green color? Is that the one that you just So this is, uh, so th- this is uh, another, it's not a russula, so if we break the stem, see how it's, see how it's fibrous? Yes. So it's not a russula. Oh. Um, this is, uh, it's in the tricholoma family. So the tricholoma family is a big family. The white matsutake is a pine mushroom. That's a choice edible. Oh, yeah. That's a type of tricholoma. Uh, man on horseback is another tricholoma that people eat. But there's also tricholoma, like this, I think it's the street tricholoma or the tiger tricholoma or something. That will, will that will really be bad. I mean, like beyond sick, like you could potentially oh, no. put you in the hospital. Yeah. So again, it's uh, I'm not sure what exact type of tricholoma that is. We'd have to look it in the book. But I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't eat it certainly because they could they could be potentially nasty. No bueno. Correct. That's uh, it looks no bueno. I'm gonna say yeah, it's that's probably the um, um, yellow yellow veil amanita would be my guess without looking it up. Um, there's one called the uh, the panther amanita. That's kind of more like a buckskin and white dots on it. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the panther, I think, is the number one poisoner in the, in the Northwest for, you know, we don't have the death caps, but the panther. This one is, uh, it says not recommended, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't experiment, you know. <laughs> These are uh, fragrant rusulas. Smell like maraschino cherry. So this is, uh, this is an edible russula. It's the short stem russula. It's the host for the lobster. Oh, that's Unfortunately, good. they don't taste very good. Oh. Yeah. Those are the guys. And then these are uh, um, I don't know, little brown mushroom, mushroom <laughs> meat. <laughs> Not very tasty. Maybe, maybe I don't know. <laughs> Not who would need them, huh? Yeah, those are um, uh, golden foliota. 
Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. No. no, these are amnesia. Yeah. I was told to stay away from LVMs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, this is more. We're seeing a lot of these ones. They're uh, they're a type of tricholoma, which is a big family of mushrooms and um, not edible. Okay. <laughs> 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 and uh, most mushrooms will um they'll like they'll have a cap and gills and they'll shed spores through the air these ones um will actually they release their spores um just when the conditions are right they'll just shoot their spores out so sometimes you'll be holding it or you can kind of breathe on it and it'll look like it's smoking and all of a sudden it will just start hmm. huh. shooting the spores out so yeah orange peel fungus um you could eat it but i don't want to yeah. you know <laughs> um yeah it could be amanita again You'd want to get the whole mushroom out to yeah, see, because the amnesia you want to look for that vulva, you know, that, that sac on the, the base. Okay. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't eat it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's a bunch of different... Well, yeah, I mean, basically most of these are, uh, are the mycorrhizal fungi. So these Sika spruce are a really good partner for a lot of mushrooms. So they're they're getting their nutrients and they're getting their moisture and and you know sugars and whatnot from these trees. And the, often the tree will benefit too. So you could have a huge forest, and one part of the forest is really dry and drought conditions. Another part of the forest is more moist. Even though those two parts of the forest are completely separate that overlaying mycelium will actually transfer oh, wow. nutrients from the forest where it's needed, you know. So, so it's a lot of times it's a beneficial for both parties, yeah. you know. Does it matter how open the forest is, if it's really dense versus, or is this um, variable? So like for chanterelles and stuff, uh -huh. uh, if it's been a thin forest, no good. It's, it's kind of more that kind of a plantation where it's like all thick and clustered together, you know. So these are, uh, these are bleeding hydenellums. Uh, which are dried out so you can see instead of having uh, gills they've got like a spine layer underneath uh, and when they're very very fresh they have little droplets that looks like blood so this is what it would look like when it's fresh um, and these aren't these aren't edible but people use them to, to dye like yarn and stuff so this little tapestry was used using mushrooms and um, my girlfriend actually has a, uh, a scarf that's dyed with this one, and it's kind of like a greenish, bluish color. It's really pretty. Dane, is this a typical turnout? Did it ever go more? Yeah. Really? I've so, actually, uh, so the, having the bike trail is essential. Yeah. yeah. I was going to do one on like a coastal loop trail, but yeah. there's no way. I mean, you can, so like I used to, uh, I used to do math, you know, put in that story in and everywhere. And like, like one Veterans Day, I came out and the parking lot was full. Yeah. Like I had to like park. And it was it's like a over a hundred people. Yeah, you, know? you don't want that. So yeah, so you do mushrooms, you're gonna get a crowd. I mean, just pretty much plan on that. You know, um, just temper your advertising yeah. down a little yeah. bit. Yeah, or I mean, you could do, you could do pre-registration. Yeah. You know, I was thinking of having like two rangers there. Yeah. Right, and then if we get over say thirty, yeah, then we start splitting up into yeah. two separate programs. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Cause I and could what, imagine. And what I do is, you know, at the beginning I was like, if you don't want to be with a mass of people, go off on your own. So we've got, a, you know, maybe a third of the people that are out doing their own thing right now. And then they can meet back at 2.30 and I can still kind of do the ID with them and whatnot.
but yeah, with just sheer numbers, it's it can be challenging, you know, and especially if you're in a uh, a narrow trail. Yeah, you know. yeah, that's why this. Yeah, I this, mean, like on the Discovery so Trail, I'm sure there's spots that you yeah. can do a do a shorter hike. Yeah. That would be good. Yeah, or know? there's a Northhead Lighthouse now mm -hmm. has a series of paved trails around it. Yeah, would probably be better. But you know, I was, first I was thinking Coastal Loop. Yeah. And but it's a little single track. Yeah. It would be yeah. a disaster with this. Group. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are the yeah. other lessons you had as you did this? What 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 are some of the other general mushroom hike lessons that you learned? Um. I mean, you're gonna get people. It's just, can I eat it? Can I eat it? Can I eat it? You know. I mean, that's like the main focus on it you know right. and you really try to stress you know when I first started doing them Salem was like freaking out like you can't tell people you know what if they eat the wrong ones if not, you know so basically you just have to do the disclaimer of like you know really make sure you know what you're doing before you eat it you know and you know most people are like overly cautious and won't try anything but there's like that two percent that are just like what are you doing you know um but yeah, just logistics is kind of the main thing. You know, you're going to have a lot of people, so pretty much plan on that. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, basically as much, you know, you're going to get people bringing all sorts of stuff with you, you know, and there's no way you're going to know everything. But being able to be familiar with, you know, the basic families, you know, you know, the basic families and get to... Get to Get, get them to key that, you know, that way, you know, and, and even, I mean, uh, you know, even if you don't know them all, you're going to know more than most 99% of the people that come to your program. <laughs> so don't let that intimidate you if you don't know all the mushrooms, you know.